Hey, I want to tell you about Moto Brand. Moto Brand was founded during the 2020 COVID-19 pandemic when the sport that we live for was taken from so many of us, whether it's cycling or moto, waking up on a Saturday morning knowing that your local track was closed, uh, there, there would be no supercross, and for many of us that we couldn't even hit our favorite local riding spot or trail with our crew. We are forced to be reminded of how much the sport of moto and cycling truly means to us. Moto Brand represents a collection of individuals that not only ride, but live to ride. It's what we think of at all times of the day, and sometimes at a detriment to your relationship with your significant other. It's for those that look at their motorcycle or their bicycle as part of their identity. Maybe it's the way that you bond with your son or your daughter or your spouse. Perhaps it's your way to blow off stress of your day job, or even, hey, it is what it is, maybe even it's your marriage. This sport is more than just a sport. For many of us, it's a way of life. It's what keeps us ticking. It's what keeps us living. Moto Brand was created for a purpose, to be more than just a shirt that you can throw on in the morning, but these designs represent who you are and what you stand for. So I encourage you to head over to the motobrand.com, check out our collection. We have a pedal collection and we have a throttle collection, and there are more designs to come that stand for something. So head over to the motobrand.com, and we'll see you there. I want to tell you about something special that Racer X is doing right now. If you go to racerxonline.com forward slash moto marketing, be sure to use our link. You can subscribe and get the Nationals box. This is pretty exciting. Check this out. They have the 2020 Pro Motocross Souvenir Program, print plus digital Racer X magazine subscription. So you get the traditional magazine as well as right to your phone or to your computer. You get the Marty Smith cover poster, 2020 Lucas Oil Pro Motocross sticker, and the 2020 Lucas Oil Pro Motocross t-shirt, and a pretty sweet little collector's uh, national box that it comes in, all for the $50 subscription. You get all that. Pretty sweet. Be sure to go to racerxonline.com forward slash moto marketing and get all the swag. Hey, big shout out to our friends at FMF. Uh, Little D and the guys are always doing some pretty exciting things, not just with the performance products, but man, they've got the coolest apparel in the game. And I want to give you guys an opportunity to get that at a little bit of a discount. If you go to FMF and, and, and pick up any gear you'd like, hats, shirts, whatever it is, upon checkout, if you enter the code MMP30, MMP30, you can get 30% off. So M M P three zero at checkout and get 30% off your order on FMF apparel. Welcome, Welcome to the Moto Marketing Podcast presented by Racer X, the podcast for moto industry professionals, entrepreneurs, and riders. If you want to grow your brand and business in today's digital first world, you have to know how to turn a stranger into a fan turn a like into a customer you have to know how to turn attention into dollars this podcast is dedicated to keeping you in the know on real marketing tactics that work in the moto world so that you grow your business and help grow the sport get ready to learn from the very same marketing experts trusted by racer x lucas oil pro motocross gncc and nbc sports they'll help you navigate the world of digital marketing for your moto brand this is the moto marketing podcast podcast Presented by Racer X. All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Moto Marketing Podcast. I'm your host, Luke Nestler. We've got uh, we've got an exciting guest with us today. We have Bob Rathcamp, um, president of Garnet, somebody that I've been wanting to get on for a long time, and uh, our, our friend uh, Scott Wallenberg over at Racer X made the introduction. Said, "Hey, he'd be a great guest." I said, "Hey, that's perfect." You were on my hit list of folks that I'd love to have on, and, and here we are. We just had a long conversation and geeked out completely about uh, e-bikes, and uh, we have a, have a lot in common there. Um, Garnet has been a brand that has been around for a very long time that everybody, um, just one of the first brands that come to mind when you think of performance products uh, and, and protection for, for Moto. Bob, I'm excited to, to have you on, and uh, welcome to the show. Thanks, Luke. I'm happy to be present here today. Thanks for uh, giving me the buzz. Yeah, absolutely. So we we just finished up talking about cycling and, and I learned something new about Garnet from one of your Facebook posts here recently that you guys have a line of, of cycling shoes. 
So I, it kind of intrigued me and I dove in and I, I realized you guys have more than just motocross boots. So we'll get into that in a minute, but I want to take a step back. You've, you know, you're the, uh, the importer uh, and have been for, for Garnet um, for a very, very long time. You're the guy that brought it um, to the States. So talk to me about just kind of that, how you got started with that. And, and really the thing that I'm intrigued most to hear is the difference between when you first started this adventure to where we are now. The landscape is very different. How we consume content is very different. How you sell product is probably very different. How did things all get started for you first? And then we'll kind of get caught up to speed. Okay. Well, you know, I've, I'm old. I've been doing this a long time. You know, I was a uh, a young guy like you and got into this whole sport because I was racing and, and, uh, and just a little sidebar. I was, I'm not the guy that brought Garnet to the U S actually Eddie Cole was that, but Eddie sold a brand. He had answer products and then, then Garnet was available, let's say. And, uh, and that's when I got it, but to back up, you know, in 84, I moved to California and, uh, started a company called Axo Sport with a friend of mine. And then in 90, well, we, we had ended up getting another brand called Cinesolo, mm -hmm. which was a Finnish brand. And we thought at the time, we thought we were like GM. We were going to have, we were going to have Cadillac and Chevrolet. So we were going to position Cinesolo as the Chevy model. And it, it didn't really work. It's almost like we were selling two Cadillacs because the consumer already knew Cinesolo brand and they, they wanted the expensive stuff. You know, they didn't want the Chevy. They wanted the Cadillac. So anyhow, I left that company in 91, I think, and started Cinesolo Pacific, which was just, um, you know, clothing, uh, an entire brand. We had sponsored Jeff Ward at the time and and then later McGrath and Yamaha Honda of Troy, et cetera. And along that journey, I think it must have been about 95. Actually, Wallenberg and I were in uh, Milan, I think, or Cologne at, at the International Motorcycle Show. <clears throat> and um, in the evening, Scott mentioned to me, he goes, hey, Sin uh, Garnet is probably looking for an importer in the U.S. And I said, so I went and had a meeting with him. Uh, fast forward, I ended up also becoming the Garnet importer. So at the time, Garnet had kind of fallen backwards as far as design and and uh, just, you know, the American scene. So, you know, we had to kind of get in there and, you know, come up with some new product, get some riders going, some advertisement. Uh, you know, get the consumer awareness back. Now, Garnet has been a factory since 1962 making product. And in the old days, I guess, when GPs were the thing, you know, they had a lot of big guys and they just kind of hung their hat on that. And then when Eddie Cole had it, you know, he had O'Mara and he had some quality guys, but then Answer got sold and Garnet just kind of went, you know, into space. It just kind of, it just kind of got neglected. So anyhow, Mike LaRocco was our first guy uh, under my watch. And then, you know, we just did a lot of stuff. You know, we designed a new boot for them. We did all the packaging. We, you know, and here we are th today. You know, I stopped selling Cinesolo. Uh, I don't remember exactly what year. That might have been 99. And we just focused our attention on Garnet to try to get you know, more traction in the boot world, which we have done. And so here we are today. So things obviously in the sport and then obviously how your customers consume content and, and are receptive to advertising looks very different from when you started, the, you know, your journey uh, with Garnet to today. Has that has that been strange for you being, you know, a businessman back then and still being a successful businessman now having to make that transition? Someone like myself, I mean, I, I, my, I started my business in 2012. So I started it in a social media digital world 
where folks like yourself and, and even Davey and Kerry Coombs, that, that's not the case for you guys. What was that transition like to being like, hey, we've got to get relevant at some capacity online. What has that been like for you? Well, I'll tell you, Luke, it, it's been an interesting journey because, you know, in 84, when we, when we were all starting or, you know, we were all young, yeah. you know, we're at trade shows and stuff and everybody's young and we're business owners, you know, and, and we're riders and we're, we're like buddies with, with all the pro guys of the time. They're kind of almost our age, you know, like maybe we were five years older than, you know, Wardy or, you know, Rick Johnson or Lachine or those guys. Well, now we're all the same guys and we all got gray hair, you know, we go to these trade shows and stuff and there, there's certainly some young people, but our, our customers have, you know, they're like our kids now. They're younger guys like you that listen to different music and, and just, you know, look at their phone for more information than let's say racer X or motocross sure. action. I mean, there's, there's still old guys that still ride dirt bikes, which is good. But um, the market's kind of changed. So to answer your question about marketing, it's it's just, it's different. You know, the magazines are still the magazines, but they've lost readership like crazy. I mean, Dirt Rider used to have a circulation of like 200,000 per month. Dirt Rider is not even printing magazines anymore. And everybody that is print magazines holds those numbers real close to their chest. So we don't really know. I mean, I don't know if any of them really have the audit, but you know, they can say it's 50, 60,000. So that's a big drop. So where are these guys getting their information? I have a 25 year old son. I he's really into bicycles. I can throw what I think is a cool magazine on bicycles on the table to just to see. Sure. He might page through it. And then he's yeah. done with it. And, but the phone is where he gets his information. So we have to learn from your demographic, you know, where, where your yeah. eyeballs are looking. You, you have a little bit of a unique um, secret weapon, if you will, inside of, w w with your son, because um, he, he works with 100%. Um, we've done some work with him. We've gotten to know him a little bit. He's, a, he's an intelligent, marketing-minded individual. He's also um, a an extremely talented cyclist that brands want to position themselves with. So you, you kind of can look to your son as far as, Hey, how are brands working with you as an influencer? And then I'm sure you guys have probably had conversations around the dinner table as far as what he uh, thinks is effective. Is it, has that happened? Have you been able to kind of refer to oh, yeah. him as a secret weapon to maybe educate you and kind of catch you up to speed on what the young hip crew might be doing? Yeah, well, my secret weapon doesn't believe too much in my strategy. <laughs> you know, he's he's telling me all the time I'm barking up the wrong trees. But, you know, I he has grown a lot with 100%, and they're a real proactive company. So it is good to get and see what they've done or what they do. or um, and, and, you know, of course, you know, he's pointed me in some directions that have been very helpful. And... Uh, but I'm kind of old school too, you know, uh, quite frankly, sometimes it's not, you know, like I don't want to see all my friends lose their jobs, you know, so I try to support them too with, they've been great for years to me at all these magazines and stuff. So I think with that said, some of the, most of the magazines that are still in existence are doing more on their social sites too. And they realize just like everyone, you know, that, the video content and and their online stuff is is probably if it hasn't already it's going to exceed their print views sure. you know yeah. going yeah. forward now so, the other aspect has been racer 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 you know we've grown up hey you gotta have a racer who's your racer who's your riders right well now this year it's been really strange because they're just practicing with their mechanic and their team guy maybe and they're kind of invisible i mean thank god Feld did what they did to finish our Supercross series. And I know Davey and his crew are really trying hard to try to put together a national schedule, but who knows, you know, it's yeah. just been so crazy. So let's, I want to talk about that. If, if you're able to, to say, I, one thing I have learned is 
Uh, I just did another podcast with a fuel uh, brand and they, they don't pay these athletes to use their products. Some of these athletes use it um, because they believe in it. Other brands you're, you're, you're paying um, if for the rider to endorse it. If you're able to say, is that something that Garnet does to where you have some athletes, you have them under contract, um, like a lot of the gear brands do, um, and, and they use your product and they have expectations from you, the brand, to post and promote the product and be at the races. Um, is that the avenue you guys take or is it a little bit, is it different? Um, and I have a second question I'll ask after you answer that. Well, I, I think to answer your question, sure. You know, the, these this is, if you're a professional motocross racer, it's your job. It's your income. It's got a short life. I mean, I wouldn't expect these guys to wear product for free, you know? So yes, we do pay them. We do have them under contract. Um, oftentimes, you know, the journey is they like our product. They want to stay with us, but there's this other big brand that comes in and just takes them away from us because they write the big check and there's, really nothing we can do to fight back when they come and he wants it it's like it's like the big bully he's just going to take it away from us because we yeah. don't have the revenue stream that sure. that they do so there are some guys that'll say you know like hey luke uh, i really want to wear your brand if you can get close i'd like to stay but i have to say with today's world and all the agents and the agents try to keep the rider the relationship between the rider and the companies sterile if you know what i mean because they don't want you to be too good of buddy buddies because that could cost the money and it cost the agent money that's my take on yeah, it sure i mean that's the way i feel about it but yeah we have we have teams we have riders so with that, the reason I'd ask that question, obviously with Supercross, at one point we didn't know if it was coming back in 2020, if we're going to have to wait until 2021. We didn't know what was going to happen. So somebody like you, you have money invested in these riders to, to be on the podium, to be, you know, to be active in racing and there to be a race. When that wasn't happening, what was going through your mind or maybe what were some of the conversations that you had with some of the teams and the athletes? Was it just, hey – can you try to showcase us on social media or was it just you had other things to worry about and you didn't even worry about that? Sure. For a month, I'd say we were worrying about other things like are all my neighbors going to be dead next week, you know, because the COVID thing was such right. a scare. Yes. So that's probably occupied all of March and some of April, <laughs> you know, and then we're like, okay, we got to get back to doing something here. So yeah start making those calls. What, what's going on? You know, the teams were just as, as much in the dark or the riders as we were, they didn't know. And there were, there were hopes that we would be able to start, but nobody really knew. So, um, yeah, we were just, we were posting old content on, on social media a little bit. We were running some ads in print magazines. We were, trying to work with editors of magazines that do test, you know, Hey, could you, could you maybe find it in your heart to try our boots and, you know, say what you think, but at least get them in front of people that was all going on. And then of course, I think if you were a motocross enthusiast, it was really great to be able to watch supercross on TV rather than CNN or something else. I mean, personally, I look forward to Wednesday nights. It was great. Yeah, it, was, it was. It was. It was. I mean, Sundays too, but Wednesday nights was a cool vibe. I, I got to get home and watch Supercross, and yeah, even though nice. people weren't there, yeah. fans weren't there, it was different. But yeah, now moving forward, I mean, I think uh, 2021 is still like they're going. You know, can we race January 5th or whatever? Right. Yeah. Can we start the season? So. I think everybody's going, what if we can't? What do we do? I mean, the good news is people can still go ride dirt bikes. Yeah. You know, What's the, your take on that? There's been such a, there's been such a, just an uptick in activity in the off-road, you know, motorsports and, and, and motorcycle space during this that I don't think, I mean, it's kind of like, oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense. But I don't think we expected this to be 
the bump of no, bump motocross. No. It, it's what, almost what sad people? that this sure. this is the bump that took <laughs> us into. But I will say, from my standpoint, what I do like about it is it's introducing a lot of young kids into motorcycles, and it's it's got the families out there riding again. Um, maybe not. I, I mean, myself, I'm guilty of it. When I had, when my son was born, I, I didn't, my mindset wasn't let's go up to the hills and get some XRs and go have fun. It's let's go to, let's go to the racetrack. We're going to get this guy racing, you know, which, yeah. which may have been wrong, you know, because, but I, I see it. I see it with a lot of guys that raced. They can't wait to get their kid behind that gate. And, you know, like in my life, I just had a bike and rode and rode and rode. And the Donnie Schmitz, you know, I, I grew up with his older brother and watched Donnie. Donnie had an XR75 and he didn't race. He rode and rode and rode and rode before he ever became a racer. So I think that's great that these kids are getting introduced to all these small motorcycles and you know some of them when things go back to normal they're going to go hey dad I, i'd rather go play baseball i don't want to ride the dirt bike but i'm optimistic that a lot of them are going to go man when can we ride the bikes again that's yeah. fun you know yeah. that's great dad can we go riding i mean that's that's my take on it and yeah, i absolutely. i hope i'm right so what's um you, you had talked about some uh cycling shoes that garnet has I believe that are new that are coming out um, or are already available. You were talking about them on your personal Facebook page, and and it caught my attention. And we kind of talked a little bit on there. Um, what what's new for for you guys, both in the motocross side as well as cycling? And then what are some of the ways that you guys try to get the word out, be it print or or through your riders or whatever that may be? Well, on the motocross side or the the off-road side, we have a new, we have a couple new models coming that are kind of uh, geared towards this adventure crew. You know, the, that is growing for a lot of, I, I even see guys in their forties that have raced or ridden for years. And now with all these cool plated bikes, I mean, Honda's got them, Yamaha's got them, Husky, KT, everybody's got, basically you could go race those bikes with a headlight and a license plate and blinkers. You could jump everything. And I see guys around here that are going to the desert with a group of five, six, seven guys and ride all day. Mm -hmm. And they get themselves in situations where motocross boots are too slippery. So we're making a like boot with the protection and such, but it's got a, an enduro sole. I, I mean, that, that segment seems to be growing quite a bit. So we're doing, we're, we're reacting to that. And then in the motocross, um, we have a couple new boots already. And so we've got some new colors that have been um, very desirable, I guess. We've sold a bunch of them. And then in cycling, you know, frankly, Luke, I was not really so into the cycling, but when my son started racing bicycles, I was going to the races all the time and I found myself there anyhow. So I was, people were asking. So so we got a little more involved in the cycling. And um, and then, of course, that new shoe that I put on my Facebook, I, I just put it there simply because I didn't know how many people are interested in e-bike shoes. So I was just kind of poking around, testing the water. That's what yeah. you saw. Yeah. So the cycling, I will say, is very challenging because there's 32 brands of cycling shoes already in the U.S. We're at the we're at the high end, you know, they're made in Italy, they're expensive, they're great. And for racing, if you're a cross country guy or a roadie, they're great, but they're expensive. Mm -hmm. And then the other problem we like with cycling is, let's say Trek and Specialized, those are the big brands, Giant in the US, they, those are the shops that are the desirable shops to sell to, uh, they have, um, premier stores and franchise stores and in order you, you just can't get in there you know because they want to sell their own stuff they've got Bontrager which is Trex line S works which is specialized they sell their own helmets they sell their own shoes they sell their own tires 
And, you know, if you want to be this showcase story, you've got to have 85% of, of their product in there and the, you know, you just can't get in. So that's been difficult, very challenging to sell cycling shoes in the U S but that's where we're at with cycling. Well, so the last question, and I'll let you go uh, as we kind of wrap things up. So we, we're both obviously cycling enthusiasts as well. Your son is as well, but you and I share that, that, that same connection that we, we love e-bikes. I have the e-bike e-bikes, team, yeah. and uh, you, we, you told me the story about you, uh, Barry Hawk, um, you know, a, a GNCC legend now races e-bikes. And you had mentioned that, you know, Barry rode his first e-bike at, uh, at our office. I've been to some uh, some conferences that I've spoke at and just gone to, to kind of soak up knowledge that um, some folks have talked about how uh, e-bicycles can help transition and make new uh, motorcyclists in the future. Um, I'm curious with somebody like yourself that's in both realms, do you see that being a thing to where, you, you, you know, as e-bikes start to grow here as they have in Europe, do you think that that's going to make – more motorcyclists or do you not see that connection? I don't know if I see that connection. I see a lot of old motocross guys getting on e-bikes. So I agree with that. And they I can that more so than the other way. I think I think that's a case. Gets gets these old guys off the couch because they're just tired of getting busted up at trying to jump everything at the track. But and, and it's funny because you know, they huff and puff and I've got some pretty big friends that I've had up, but man, they can descend because those motocross skills, you know, they're still there. And, Mm -hmm. and the only way they could get up that hill is with that e-bike, but then they get addicted again and their blood pressure's going down and the weight starts dropping and you see that old motocrosser come out of me. And and that's, that's cool to me. I mean, that, that's just really been awesome. I think that's, you know, that, that as far as the old motocrosser getting on the e-bike because it's a little bit safer. I mean, that's Barry's story. I mean, Barry, again, race quads, race motorcycles, runs, runs one of the bigger teams in GNCC. And I think that you getting him on that bike got him into this year's. He actually, fun fact, as of recording this on July 29th, he's actually in the lead for the national championship in his class. Oh, really? I'm also in his class. Oh, cool. (laughs) that but that's a prime example somebody that doesn't want to hit the ground e-bikes are a great great way um i know people in the moto community love it when people talk about e-bikes steve mathis gets a bunch of crap for it but i think they're a great thing and i think it it they are entwined in the moto community and i think it's uh i'm curious to see how that grows i'm curious to see how the the well, look at steve i mean steve's a good example too i exactly. i i've known steve for a long time i don't think he was in the best of shape let's just put it out there but i think that e-bike has helped him you know it's he's exactly. he's hooked on it obviously and i see he's riding dirt bikes again and i think it's awesome you know yeah i agree well bob it, it's it has been a pleasure talking to you. We've, we've got more in common than I thought. It's been interesting hearing your story and uh, it's uh, have a lot of respect for, for your son as a, as a business person and an athlete. And, and it's been nice chatting with you as well and learning about what you guys are doing at Garnet and just kind of the transition from back in the day to, to, to how things work for you today. Um, yeah. We enjoy having you on the show. I think people are going to enjoy this, this conversation. So I appreciate you being here with us. Yeah, I appreciate you having me. Thank you very much and uh, look forward to riding an e-bike with you. That's right. We'll make it happen soon. All right. See you later. Thank you for listening to the Moto Marketing Podcast. If your goal is to get real, measurable results from your marketing that will grow your company revenue, then check out how Impact Media can get the same results that they have for Moto's most iconic brands by visiting thinkimpact.com. That's T-H-I-N-K-I-M-P-A-K-T.com. Have a marketing question that you want answered on the show? Send your questions to questions at motomarketingpodcast.com. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. And we'll catch you on the next episode of the Moto Marketing Podcast.